Hey world, Dan Brown here, taking a break from EDH Rec Tech this week to talk about the fully spoiled Commander 2018 set. We know every card that's going to be in it, and more relevant for uh, our purposes today, we know every new card that they are going to be printing. I'm going to review every single one, and I don't want to waste too much time. Let's just get right into it. There's a letter grade in the lower right corner, and we're starting with, uh, we're going in Wooburg order, white, blue, black, red, green, multicolor, artifacts, lands, and alphabetical order for each category. Starting things off with an A+. Plus. Boreas Charger, I just think this card is really good. It's a ramp effect outside of green. If you do not have access to green, I think that this deck is going to find homes um, you know, in, in a lot of decks that don't have access to green. It's a 2-1 evasive body that also ramps, and then in most situations it's better than ramp. It gets you a planes and then probably a few more planes to your hand, helping to refill your hand. So it's just excellent, excellent card advantage. Uh, and slapping equipment on this, you can start chipping away at life totals. Really good. A plus. Great card. Not so good, in my opinion. Imperial Storm. I'm giving this one a C plus. Like, I, okay, I love that Wizards is beginning to, you know, dip their toes into exploring um, uncharted design space relative to the command zone. And I do think that this ability for copying a spell for each time you've cast your commander, um, it can be good. I'm glad to see it. But for this particular version of that, uh, you know, block of texts application, uh, to, to, to get to really good territory, you'd probably want to have cast your commander three times, you know, getting four, four, four white angels. Then you're starting to get into, like, game-breaking territory. But w without that, I don't know. I think that you might be better suited with... Um, some sort of uh, mid-range, you know, six drop, seven drop, big flying threat with lifelink or something. I, I mean, I don't really know. This this will find some homes, but I'm not convinced that it is the best way to, the, the best card to you know, dedicate a slot to for trying to close out games in a battle cruiser meta. It's just too contingent on um, having a commander that's been cast many times. If you're only getting one four four flyer, that's the worst case scenario. That. It's not so good. Um, Heavenly Blade Master. I'm giving it a B, solid B. Um, I like any sort of flying mid rangey threat. I'm kind of I, I have an implicit bias against like token strategies, and I guess this does kind of play into token strategies a little bit. The final block of text is an anthem effect equal to the number of auras and equipments, and that, that kind of the only knock I have against this card is that it's pulling you kind of in two different directions. Like just looking at the you know keywords in the first block of text. You would think that this, you know, is meant for a Voltron deck to be a Voltron creature, but the last block of text is pulling you in a, a kind of go wide direction, and those things don't always go together that well. You might have to go a little out of your way to make it kind of work to find a kind of seamless home for this card. But I mean, it, it, it's definitely good. Like, you, it definitely gets you value the turn it comes into play if you have a lot of creatures, right? If you're playing kind of a go wide thing, but that also runs auras and equipments. It, it, it is kind of weird. I, I don't know how many homes it'll find, but um, could be good. Loyal Unicorn giving a C plus. It's a passing grade. It's fine. It's a mid-range creature, like a kind of... When I say mid-range, when I'm talking about, like, commander decks, that normally means 5-drop, 6-drop, 7-drop, because you expect games of commander to go longer than other constructed formats, where, like, a 7-drop might be just considered a late-game threat. Um, so this is more of a traditional mid-range at the 4-drop slot, uh, and mid-range is kind of difficult to make work I find in Commander just because if you want to win with three drops, four drops, five drops in kind of a battle cruiser punchy style EDH game, uh, you need a critical mass of them that is so high in terms of number of card slots dedicated that you're not including as many ramp, card draw, and control effects, kind of more fundamentally good uh, effects. And so the deck winds up being just a little bit lukewarm. Um, you know, that being said, in the right build, granting all of your creatures, um, you know, vigilance and allowing them, you know, not to take any damage during combat. There are going to be some situations where that's strong, but you always want to consider what the worst case scenario is, and that would be either you don't have your commander in play, or you don't have that many other creatures in play, or the board is not conducive to attacking with those other creatures, even if uh, they wouldn't take damage and they don't have to tap to attack. Uh, yeah, I'm giving this one a C plus. I don't think it's quite as good as it might look at first blush. Although it is a unicorn, and so that's cool. Magus of the ba a balanced balance. Magus of the balance. 
balanced balance, if you will. The card balance, if you're unfamiliar, is a sorcery for one and a white that just does the block of text on this creature as a sorcery for two mana. It is banned in Commander. That is too, that is far too good. Uh, the question here is, did they balance it correctly? Did they overbalance it? Is it maybe underpowered now? Like, if anything, and the minus after the A here is because I think maybe it's not good enough. <laughs> uh, you know, if you don't have a way to grant haste, it has to sit out there for a full turn cycle before you can pop it off for five mana next turn. Um, the fact that it has legs means it's vulnerable. Opponents <laughs> who might not want that to happen might have some agency in preventing that from happening. Um, and by the time it does go off, you've poured seven mana into it. Um, you know, that does seem like a more fair cost for a balance type uh, effect. And yeah, the flip side of this is just the effect is so huge, it hits lands, and that's something that white can do, on, uh, you know, even without balance. Um, it is a board wipe, another thing that you know, white obviously is very, very good at, although it, it, lot, it makes players discard cards. Um, that's not something that white gets to interact with that often. So uh, just very, very strong. If you build around, and, and of course, if you run lots of enchantments, it doesn't mention enchantments at all. So uh, this would go very well, and I think it does go in the enchantment deck that we're seeing for Commander 2018. So yeah, A-, minus. I think they did a pretty good job of balancing balance and reintroducing that very famous block of text into our favorite format. Uh, Aminatu's Augury, I don't love... Uh, giving it a C, just because if I am pouring six or sorry eight mana, sorcery speed, I want to know that you know should that effect resolve, you always run the risk of something getting countered no matter what it is. But should this resolve, I want to know for eight mana that it is going to have a, a big dynamic effect on you know my agency in the game, and this can you know if you hit an Eldrazi and a time stretch then great, you're, you're in business, but uh, you're not guaranteed to um, get eight mana's worth of value off of this. You don't know what you're getting. It's kind of random. Um, you know, I would feel a lot better about it if this cost six mana and exiled six cards. I just think eight mana is a, is a lot to ask. Um, you know, and, and also, if any control effects that you trip into with this aren't quite as good as they would be just sitting in your hand, because part of what makes control so good is timing. You know, using it exactly at the right moment to cost your opponents exactly the amount of tempo that you might need to edge out some sort of an advantage. Um, and so if you are forced to fire off a, a control effect during your main phase from this, it's not quite as strong as it would be otherwise. Um, so, yeah, I mean, don't don't love it. Um, Echo Storm, A-, minus. they're just giving some toys to artifact decks and really trying to bring blue into <laughs> the artifact deck fold um, by printing, you know, some commanders that are, you know, blue-red, is it, uh, heavily focused on artifacts. So, um, copying an artifact multiple times, you know, obviously this you know, wants to go in a deck with a low CMC commander that might see some action, might bounce back and forth quite a bit. Um, obviously better late game when your commander has been cast many times, but um, yeah, yeah, as a mid-range sort of effect for five mana, you're often going to get more than five mana's worth of value off of this, so I think it's good. Um, Estrid's Invocation, I think a strong point of comparison for this is the Echo Storm. Like, this also only goes in a very linear enchantment deck, obviously. I would not recommend running this just as, a, oh, I don't know, I have a copy, so I'll throw it in my deck and maybe I'll get two Rhystic Studies. Like, yeah, if you got two Rhystic Studies, it would be good, but you always want to think about the worst-case scenario, and that's this coming down, you know, being in your hand without a good enchantment target in play. But if you have a dedicated enchantment build, this it can be great. The blink effect is nothing but upside. Maybe there's an ETB and it draws you some extra cards. Uh, it just allows you to change which enchantment you are copying um, whenever you feel like it. So I, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's good. In an enchantment deck, it's good. I probably wouldn't run it in anything else. Ever watching Threshold, I'm kind of surprised there wasn't already a card that said this exact thing. Um, kind of <laughs> filling a hole maybe in the game. Uh, with this. It's simple. Um, I am going to add this 
to a deck that I own in paper that is Siddhar and Ludovic. I'll be doing an EDH rec tech in a couple weeks about that, so be on the lookout. Um, yeah, any effect that kind of warps the incentive structure for who someone attacks, uh, I just find really interesting. First of all, uh, you can also think of this, I mean, obviously this has card draw built in. It has the words draw a card uh, printed on it. But you can also think of it as a pseudo removal spell. Any time an opponent chooses to attack someone else instead of you because there's some slight drawback to attacking you specifically, that's kind of like a removal spell. It's kind of better than a removal spell. You haven't lost a card and yet you have still prevented yourself from taking damage in an attack. This is you know, That's kind of, kind of, in a way of thinking, better than using a targeted um, a creature removal spell to deal with a threatening attacker to have it not attack you in the first place. Loyal Drake, A+. Plus. Love it. Love this card. So, I mean, even if it was just a 2-2 flyer for 3 that had the words, when it enters the battlefield, draw a card printed on it. That would be amazing. I would run that in so many decks. Uh, you know, blinking that in and out would be so good. It would be like a Baleful Strix, kind of like a Mull Drifter. I, I love that. Slapping equipment on it and you're in business. And the fact that you can get that value over and over and over again makes it kind of like a Phyrexian Arena drawing you a card every turn. Um, I, I think this is really cool. I mean, it's really simple. Like, this is a simple card, but it's good. Love me some loyal Drake. Octopus Umbra. Given this a B, uh, it, it, it will find some homes in decks. It's kind of a specific subset of decks, but where you have a low power commander, like literal power toughness. Um, the CMC would probably want to be lower than five on the commander, so you could go, you know, commander one turn, then octopus umbra next turn. Um, yeah, because I would assume you'd almost always want to put this on your commander, like totem armor gets you the most value when it's protecting your most valuable creature, the creature you have built your deck around the most. So uh, a creature with literal low power that the mana you spent on the creature is going towards some ability in the text box, but where you still have an incentive to attack. Like off the top of my head, Edric Spymaster would be a great commander for this to go. Uh, and it defends Edric and allows Edric to also kind of begin attacking um, to draw you some cards. That's just, just, an, just an example. Um, Primordial Mist, I'm giving a B minus to. I don't know that it is as good as it looks at first blush. I would caution people against um, just throwing this into a deck willy-nilly. Um, in a deck with lots of morph and manifest, um, it could be cool. This card kind of fixes the biggest problem with manifest um, in its second block of text. Like, and if you already had a whole bunch of manifested creatures in play when this hits the battlefield, then it starts to feel really, really strong. But if you don't have any and you just play this like on curve turn five, it, it, it's just a little bit worse, I think than an effect that would draw you one card at the end of turn every turn. You know, over the course of many turns, it starts to make up for the five mana you sunk into it, but uh, there's no guarantee of that. It doesn't do it right away. Um, so I'm just a little bit bearish on it. Like, it, it is fine. It fixes it, it in a manifest deck, very strong, but, you know, fixes manifest a little bit. But other than that, um, Videlkin Humiliator, it's humility on a stick, and he is literally holding a stick right there. Eh, given a C plus to it, there is a narrow subset of decks that could use this. The biggest problem is that it does not have haste. You would want to have some sort of boots or greaves, or you'd want to be in red and have anger in the art or something so that you could um, get value off of this the turn that it hits the, uh, the battlefield. Um, and you would also probably want some way to deal one damage to all creatures, like a pestilence type thing, or a way to give all creatures minus one, minus one, and uh, in order to make sure that you benefited the most disproportionately off of that, you would also want to make sure that you had a pretty large suite of like mid-range creatures that wouldn't die to that. You'd want a way of wiping all of your opponent's creatures while holding on to all of yours. So, you know, in that very specific deck, this is good. But otherwise, you know, I would caution you against just throwing this into some miscellaneous EDH deck you've got lying around. Crash of Rhino Beetles. Uh, given a beat, I mean, this is simple. You know, it's a, in the end game, it's a 15-15 trample for five. That's amazing. 
And a 5-5 five, five trample for 5, that, that's not quite as amazing. But if you're in green, you know, you know pretty reliably you're going to get to 10 lands by the time we're on turn like 7 or 8, probably, hopefully. Um, yeah, so, so end, end game, very, very strong. You've got to win somehow. You've got to dedicate some deck slots to just getting in there for damage if you're playing a battle cruiser game of Commander. So you're not going to see playing any combo decks, but for the, the majority of play groups, why not? Need 15 cards, 15 or so cards, to deal 40 points of damage to every opponent and 15 power for 5. Not bad. Genesis Storm, another um, example of you know this first block of text making the number of times you have cast your commander relevant to an effect. This, I, I like this better than Genesis Wave. I like this better than Villainous Wealth um, because you are guaranteed to get a certain, you know the number of non-land permanents that you will be getting the moment that this resolves. You don't have to pay X and hope that you're going to hit something very strong. And, and, and if you build around this in a very linear way, you can know with certainty what exact permanence you will be getting if you're, you know, it's weird because green is not the best color for control, but if you had this in a control shell, you could probably, you know, use this as a pseudo tooth and nail. Um, if you, the only permanents you ran, like, comboed with each other or just synergized really strongly or were just enormous creature threats. Um, yeah, the fact that you are guaranteed to get a non -land, a certain number of non-land permanents means that you can dig pretty far with this. And that it's six mana, you know, you're going to want to wait until the late game, end game, to cast this anyway. Um, you know, hopefully you'll have cast your commander a few times. Yeah, I mean, the thing that's awkward about this first block of text on any card is that not every deck wants its commander to be cast and then to die and then recast and to die. That's a lot of lost tempo. But if you have, like, partner commanders, say, the, the, the first block of text, uh, any card that has this first block of text is going to be, I think, a little bit better in partner commander decks, um, especially if there's some sort of, uh, you know, like sacrifice sub-theme going on with those partner commanders. So, uh, yeah, Genesis Storm, I, I think, is strong. Doesn't go into any old deck, but some decks that it goes in um, will really, really, really like it. Uh, Loyal Guardian, I don't like it! <laughs> I, I was saying earlier, mid-range creatures sometimes struggle to find a home in Commander because in order for a mid-range strategy to work, you need to dedicate lots of deck slots to those mid-range creatures, and those are deck slots you're not dedicating to ramp, card draw, and control. Uh, and y yeah, I, like, if you watched my Progenitus, sorry, not Progenitus, my Ramos deck tech, um, I felt similarly about Corpse Jack Menace. Uh, there are a lot of points of comparison. Same CMC, same power toughness, and both interact with plus one, plus one counters. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 maybe I'm just biased against counter decks. I don't like keeping track of that many dice, like, genuinely. That's why I don't... Uh, none of my decks are plus one, plus one counter decks that I own in paper anyway. Uh, but I, I still think that there would be better ways, probably, to put counters on a team in a go-wide token strategy. Um, it's just... It, it doesn't quite come together here. Although I am glad to see them printing more cards with the Lieutenant ability, like the commander being in play matters, seems like some design space with room to grow. Speaking of which, Myth Unbound, interacting with the command zone and commander tax in a way, um, I, I like it. I think that this, again, is very good in partner, well, I don't want to say very good. Uh, it, it's definitely a build-around card, right? You want to play this in a deck that you know, maybe has multiple commanders, maybe a partner commander deck, um, where you don't mind one or both of your commanders um, dying pretty frequently, going back to the command zone. The uh, savings on command tax is, is a little bit better in a partner commander deck than it would be in just a, a deck with only one commander, right? Um, so I... Yeah, I, I don't hate it. I don't love it. Um, yeah, you could build around it and probably draw many cards. Three mana is not a ton to pour into it. And you do have the opportunity to you know, have it replace itself the turn it comes into play if you have a way to sacrifice a commander. But again, every time you sacrifice a commander, it is somewhat of a tempo loss. So you want to make sure you're still making up for it with um, other effects in the deck. 
yeah, the, the design space, the, the design space they're pushing with, you know, num copying spells for the number of times that you've cast a commander and then drawing a card anytime your commander goes back into the command zone. Not something we've seen a ton. Oh, and, and, and one commander that leaps to mind with those, both of those sorts of effects is Derevi, the Bant bird commander. I mean, very, very strong. If you've played commander for a while, you've probably run into some pretty good Derevi decks. But what makes Derevi so good with these sorts of abilities is that it gets around commander tax entirely. You can just pay four mana to drop Drevi into play from the command zone. And also a card coming up pretty soon has Commander Ninjitsu, which also gets around commander tax, which might make effects like this slightly better. But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Nylea's Colossus, giving this one a C. Yeah, it's seven mana, which is pretty steep. Like, the effect is good. Doubling the power, you know, you've got to get there somehow if you're playing in a punchy battle cruiser metagame. Uh, but it doesn't grant any sort of evasion. And again, it costs seven mana. It's also an enchantment, which means it's a little bit more vulnerable. I, uh, yeah, it'll find a home. Like, it'll probably go in a few Xenogod decks that have other ways to grant evasion. Trample. Trample would be good. But, yeah, Ravenous Slime. I'm giving this a B plus. I like this. It's, it reminds me a little bit of Scavenging Ooze in that it rains on the parade of like reanimator strategies, exiling creatures when they would hit the graveyard. Like Not going to be relevant in every single pod, but still st statistically significant. Um, I I'd want to run this in a deck that has lots of spot removal so that I can control on a dime if and when and how it, it, it gets... Plus one, plus one counters equal to creatures that I am destroying. Um, and, and not being blocked by creatures of power two or less basically uh, prevents it from being chump blocked. It's not the best form of evasion. But all of those like pretty decent abilities stapled to the same thing at three CMC. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like it. Um, you, kind of a narrow subset of decks that I'd want to run it in, but... Um, you know, it, th th this will see play, and this will annoy graveyard strategy decks. Um, Turn Timber Sower. It's just maybe the most solid new new card that we're seeing printed um, that interacts with lands, other than Lord Windgrace himself, who we will talk about pretty soon. Um, you know, in, in a lands matter graveyard sort of Ferris wheel of value deck. Uh, where lands are going in the graveyard and coming out of the graveyard and going back to the graveyard and coming out and you're drawing cards and getting triggers every time you know something happens like that. Um, you know th this could fit right in. Um, you would maybe want some other ways to take advantage of zero one plant tokens. Uh, although you know it, it wouldn't be too hard to get three of those plants in play from the first block of text here on the sower and then spend one mana to return a land to your hand. Like, I, I think that for three mana, this is a lot of value packed into a creature in a very specific lands matter, graveyard sort of, crucible of world sort of, life from the loam sort of uh, deck. <laughs> uh, I, I like it. Give it an A. Whip Tongue Hydra, kind of a, a new bane of progress, but for flying creatures instead of artifacts and enchantments. Yeah, bane of progress, I think, is a pretty good point of comparison for this. Um, I think this is a little bit worse than Bane of Progress because there's no guarantee that there will be enough flying creatures for this to be the blowout that we all ho hope for it to be when it's in our hands. Um, there will be some situations where you know the, the one flying creature on board is maybe under the control of an opponent that you don't have that much beef with, who isn't really the arch enemy right now. Uh, there will be more situations where this is dead in hand. Like, you're... you're more likely to run into a board where artifacts and enchantments matter because so many people run mana rocks, <laughs> basically. So, uh, Bane of Progress, a little bit better, but Whip Tongue Hydra can be a blowout, metagame dependent, and, and it has the same problem of being just kind of a mid range creature without a lot of evasion, right? But um, you know, the fact that it is kind of a control effect um, makes up for that a little bit. This will see some play. This will be a blowout every once in a while, but. Um, I don't know. On the bubble. It's a bubble card. 
Amanatu the Fate Shifter, giving this an A+, one of my absolute favorite new cards from Commander 2018. It can be your Commander, obviously. Esper, um, it, well, so first of all, the color combination Esper, white, blue, black, lends itself to kind of generic good stuff strategies. White has great board wipes, great spot removal. Blue has counter spells and card draw. Black has tutors and ways to like get there fast, ways to generate lots of mana. Uh, you know, just put enough of those sorts of cards into a deck along with some way to win, and you don't have to put that much thought into you know what you're doing. Like that that's gonna be good enough. So it lends itself to generic good stuff strategies, but there have not been that many great commander options for Esper good stuff. Like Aloro is you know basically the obvious choice. Until now, Amanatu, I mean a little bit more of a build around than Aloro. The the Plus one ability slightly incentivizes like miracles, and the minus one ability here maybe incentivizes um, what you would and wouldn't include more than anything else. Um, creatures with enter the battlefield effects, or like oblivion ring type control effects, and you can switch what you have exiled um, on a whim. Like like um, baleful strix because of the minus one is so 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 good in Amanatu or Mull Drifter. Like I might not run Mull Drifter in a different. Uh, Esper good stuff built, but in Amanatu, almost definitely. And then the ultimate here, like, could be good. It probably won't be used all that often. Well, and, and, and let me back up bigger picture. Planeswalkers in Commander, I don't feel like are as good as they tend to be in other constructed formats, um, just because you have three opponents generally. Those are, you know, that's three times as many attack steps where your Planeswalker can be dealt with, and often... In the political situation of a commander pod, um, attacking the planeswalker is like the politically safest choice to make. You're not going for anyone's life total. Um, so all else being equal, go for the open planeswalker. But Amanatu kind of takes that into account pretty well. Um, the, the fact that she is only three mana means that, you know, I, I probably would not be racing to get her into play on turn three. Right? I would probably want to wait until I have mana to hold up for some sort of a control effect so I have agency when it's not my turn. Um, and I would hopefully have some sort of chump blocker out there to keep her safe, get some kind of grindy value turn after turn. Like, if she stays in play for three turns, you've gotten your value out of her. Um, so she's just really good from a gameplay perspective and also love the character design. Man, I could talk for a long time about... Um, wizards making up for lost time when it comes to just, like, inclusion on these cards. I think it's really important that um, all people from all backgrounds see um, people that look like them represented in magic cards if we want um, this game to continue to grow and we want to make sure that, you know, these collections that we have that are worth a lot of money retain their long-term value. Like, there's a, there's a selfish argument to be made for... Um, inclusion, aside from the fact that it's just the right dang thing to do. Anyway, um, Eryxmethys, Slumbering Isle. Given this an A, it's really, it's this is interesting. If you had this as your commander, it's basically a, an explosive vegetation in the command zone, but better because like the land would not have summoning sickness, uh, so you'd be able to tap it for a green-blue the turn it comes into play for four. So in a way, it only loses you two mana on the turn. And you can get kind of tricky. You don't have to remove a slumber counter. It's a May trigger, which means that you could sit on just having one slumber counter on this for most of a game. You could play a control shell and you know wait until two opponents have lost and you're down to just you and someone else. And then at instant speed, remove the last slumber counter and suddenly have a 12-12 uh, swinging in. It seems it seems really strong. Um, like, like, it, it's a unique kind of commander to build around. And as for having this in the ninety nine, I think it's also very good. You know, four mana for a land that taps for two. Um, it stays safe when it's a land. Very hard to deal with. You know, any particular land. Um, and then that you can make it a 12 12 but that you don't have to. If you had to remove a slumber counter, this would be a much worse card. But because of the word may right there. This card is really cool. Really cool design. Uh, really unique. Brutaclad Telcor Engineer. Given this one an A, also 
Um, I don't love token strategies, as I've been saying. It's just a lot to keep track of on your playmat. But uh, this one does seem pretty darn good. It, it has an effect on the board immediately if you have been doing your due diligence to build out um, tokens, you know, turns one through five, assuming that you're just like on curve and haven't been ramping, which you could, but you could definitely be ramping. This is an artifact commander. There are lots of rocks as we all know. Uh, yeah, so the question just becomes, what big token are you creating? How are you making like a 4-4 four, four or a 5-5, five, five, maybe with some f sort of evasion? Um, in blue-red, I'm sure that there are ways. Um, I haven't done like an advanced card search right now to figure out what the best ways would be. I was thinking, though, if you wanted to get really goofy, make kind of a bottom-up deck here, you could uh, do some sort of a Dark Depths Thespian stage to get a 2020 Indestructible. And I know it's legendary, okay? You'd have to also get Mirror Gallery in there somehow to turn off the legend rule. But then you could have an army of 2020 Flying Indestructible. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that could close out a game. And it would, they would all have haste because of Brutaclad. Just a thought. That could be a cool deck. I like it. Um, Estrid the Masked, giving her a B plus. She's my least favorite of the new Planeswalkers that are able to be commanders um, because unlike uh, Aminatu over here, <laughs> just showing you Aminatu again because I like Aminatu so much. Unlike Aminatu, Estrid, I mean, costs one more mana and is not like a generic good stuff commander, right? She is very dedicated to like a linear enchantment build and even there she doesn't um, replace herself uh, I guess Aminatu does not automatically replace herself but has that kind of pseudo cycle on the top of the deck which feels kind of like replacing herself not to mention if you blink a bale full strix you'll have replaced um, Aminatu with that but anyway anyway enough about Aminatu Estrid um, like yeah in a dedicated enchantment build uh, could be strong, although I would argue that some of the other commander options in this pre-con would be stronger, I think, in most situations, right? Because if Estrid dies, um, you know, the cost goes up to six there. There's no guarantee that you'll have a ton of enchanted permanence. Um, totem armor is best when you're granting it to your commander, your most important creature, and so if this is your commander already, um, you just, you just kind of have to build around a pretty specific set of abilities. Uh, I don't know that it's that strong. The ultimate is good, and it is easier to get to Estrid's ultimate than maybe some of the other um, Planeswalker commanders that have been spoiled, but... I mean, just the fact that all else being equal, other opponents might attack the Planeswalker that's in play instead of going for someone's face because it's politically easier. The fact that there are three combat steps you have to get your Planeswalker to loop through instead of just one in, like, other constructed formats. Uh, yeah, yeah, I... Uh, it's fine. You can make a good deck. It's a B plus. That's not a bad grade. It's just not as good as some of the other Planeswalkers. Gyrus, Waker of Corpses, giving this one a B minus. I do think it's interesting that the first line of text mean it would take into account commander tax. If you pay commander tax, that's just part of what you paid for it, so it would enter with that many counters. But there's no guarantee of value the turn it comes into play. It does not have haste. Um, it does not have any form of evasion, so it can be chump blocked. And the reanimation ability is, is kind of strong, but you exile the creature permanently with lesser power, which means that you can't get like an Alicia style recursive value engine thing going on. Uh, and, and you start, you know, going through the gas that you have in your graveyard relatively quickly. Yeah, just the combination of it not having haste, not having immediate value. Needing to pour lots of mana into it anyway. Like, yeah, and so by the time that you had enough big bomby creatures that you could reanimate tokens of with in the deck, uh, those are deck slots that you're not dedicated to ramp card draw and control, and so your fundamentals might become a little bit weaker. So, yeah, I, I don't love it, and you know I also don't love it in the 99 for a lot of the same reasons. Uh, B minus is okay. It's okay. Um, Kestia the Cultivator, giving her an A, if for no other reason than that she replaces herself, I think she would be a better commander option than um, Estrid. Uh, and Bestow adds a little resilience to the you know card drawing ability. And plus four, plus four, very relevant. Lots of flying options, lots of evasion op evasive options 
in these colors. Um, yeah, she, she she draws you cards. That that's the name of the game. Whoever plays Magic the longest wins. And drawing cards is how you play Magic for longer. Lord Windgrace given an A plus. I think this is excellent commander design. Glad to see a Jund commander that is not prosh. That feels like pretty playable. That's not also like a token strategy or plus one plus one counter strategy. This is a lands matter commander. Uh, I mean, there have been some lands matter commanders you know, printed before, but not in so many colors. There are going to be a lot of Gitrog monster players who I think kind of shoehorn red into that deck and swap out commanders for Lord Windgrace here. Um, Lord Windgrace also good. And gets around some of the drawbacks that I've been talking about with Planeswalkers in Commander as a format just by replacing himself immediately and potentially two times over if you pitch a land, which shouldn't be too hard. Like any deck with Lord Windgrace at the helm is probably running more lands than normal. I'd say somewhere you know, in the 40 range, 40, 41 lands maybe. Um, so pitching a land wouldn't be too hard. Then you get to draw two cards. And then returning lands to the battlefield... Um, just seems like something that a Lands Matter deck would be trying to do anyway. Um, and the ultimate, I mean, you can get to the ultimate uh, with Lord Windgrace. I mean, not, not easily, I don't want to say, but it, it, it's, it won't be unheard of to destroy six non-land permanents. That's a huge blowout. That is probably going to get you the edge in any game where you ultimate with Lord Windgrace. Yeah, re really, really like Lord Windgrace. Really think that it's going to... See play in a lot of play groups near you very soon. Sahili the Gifted um, is another blue-red commander option for an artifact deck, something that players have been begging wizards for better options on for years, and now finally, all within a span of like six months, we're getting like three commander options. Like she, she reminds me a lot of Joyra, printed in Dominaria, did a um, EDH rec tech deck tech about a Joyra build that I built. Um, same converted mana cost for Sahili. Um, the most relevant ability on Sahili, I think, is going to be her second plus one. Uh, what makes the most sense to me would be uh, using that to try to cast an enormous Blue Sun's Zenith or Stroke of Genius. Try to draw just so many cards, because if you're already running lots of mana rocks, those can then tap for mana and then reduce the cost of that spell uh, to just yeah draw you so, so many cards. The minus seven also um, could hopefully win you the game, question mark, if you have enough good artifacts. Yeah, I don't know. A, a generic good stuff artifact commander in these colors, having more options for that is nothing but a good thing. Yeah, given her a B, you know, I think Joyra might be more powerful, but Sahili, a good option. Taunos Urza's Apprentice earns an A because of the first word in the text box, and that is haste. Being able to do that, the turn it comes down, you can kind of look at it as a, you know, pseudo, pseudo four mana sorcery that if it survives a turn cycle, you can abuse again and again. And maybe there are ways to untap it and use it multiple times per turn. It can get pretty ridiculous pretty fast in some sort of a you know, Rube Goldberg machine-style artifact deck in these colors. Another commander option for an artifact deck in these colors. Something that people have been begging for for a long time, and now all of a sudden we have an embarrassment of riches. Anyway, Fantis the Warweaver. Um, I really want to like this card a lot. It is cool. It is in colors that need, you know, more commander options, so that it's good to have another. Um, <laughs> the two keyword abilities I think it's missing. If it, if it had these two keywords, I would give it an A or an A+. Plus. It's missing First Strike and Death Touch. If it had that, then it would be able to keep itself a whole heck of a lot safer. It would be very hard to deal with. I like any effect that kind of warps combat you know, it forces all creatures to attack, which is also helps you get more games in on the night. You know, it helps <laughs> encourage games to reach some sort of a conclusion when everyone's creatures, you know, are attacking. But the, the downside here is it might just die to its own ability. Like, it forcing itself to attack means that you might have to attack into an opponent that can deal with it. Um, like, I would also love to run this in a deck with lots of like propaganda style effects, creating some sort of attacks, disincentivizing your opponents from attacking you, but not having access to blue or to white is problematic on that front. Those are the cards that have the most sort of, you know, quote, pillow fort effects in them. So yeah, it's, it's cool. I'm sure you can make a cool deck with it. Uh, Tuvasa the Sunlit, 
Very simple card. I love seeing three color commander options that cost just those three colors, like three CMC. Um, Tuvasa the Sunlit gets plus one, plus one for each enchantment. And, you know, she's able to, or it, it is able, I don't know. Let's, we don't need to gender things unnecessarily. It's able to, whoa, hey, whoa. <laughs> that was loud. Full disclosure, I'm recording this from a hotel room right next to a minor league baseball stadium. Sounds like they're doing some sort of a sound check, so maybe things are about to get noisy. I digress. Tufasa, yeah, replaces replaces itself and is a three CMC option for a three color commander for an Enchantment Matters deck. Um, seems like a very strong option. Uh, Verena Lich Queen, B plus is a good grade. I don't love tokens. <laughs> But maybe this deserves an A minus. This is probably the best option for a zombie tribal deck. And in a zombie deck, the graveyard is an active zone. So drawing and then discarding, you know, the discarding isn't so much like discarding if you're playing from the graveyard. The graveyard is kind of an extension of your hand. So this can generate some pretty strong card advantage, also giving access to all three of these colors, not just blue-black. For a zombie deck. Just, just seems like a zombie deck could make use of access to the best board wipes in the game, for example, because zombies don't care so much. Graveyard's an active zone. Yeah, yeah this is pretty good. I give it a B plus. Yeah, maybe an A minus even. Maybe an A minus. Wind Grace's Judgment, though, gets an A plus. One of my absolute favorite new cards in Commander 2018. Um, five mana is the only drawback. It's like a little bit spendy mana-wise, but destroying any non-land permanent for all of your opponents at instant speed, very hard for me to think of a situation where this isn't, you know, if not a blowout, at least a very dynamic play. You can do this the end step before your turn and really change the landscape, sculpt the landscape exactly the way you need it sculpted before a critical turn. Or in a pinch, if someone attacks you, you know, blow up one of their things and get some bonus value from opponents. Just very, very strong. Five mana is a lot. Like, if you're in a more competitive meta and want to keep a tighter curve with your removal effects, then I can see an argument for not running it. But, um, yeah, very, very, very strong. Um, Zancha Sleeper Agent, giving her a B plus. I mean, yeah, the, the only downside here is that you are giving your opponents ways to draw cards. Um, and it's not always the most fun thing to pick on one opponent in particular. There might be some feels bads, but in terms of interesting design space, uh, this card is a home run. Uh, just casting it for three, well, three mana for a five, five. Like I, I like ways that Wizards comes up with to justify getting lots of power on board early. So the drawback being that an opponent gets control of it, but um, also tinkering with the design space that you know allows a, a creature to attack only your opponents but not you and th there have been some like curses some auras that you can put on creatures that um kind of turn them into your uh <laughs> kind of i don't want to say zombie because we were just talking about zombie tribal here but i mean like in, in a in a more uh, man manner of speaking, they turn into your zombies. You brainwash them into only attacking your opponents. Uh, yeah, that, that is design space that they can really push out, right? Because a laser cannon that does not belong to you but is not aimed at you is basically your laser cannon. Uh, so, And there's a literal laser cannon in the background here. Or I think it's like a Phyrexian Tower. I don't know what it is. But the well, only drawback is it draws your opponent's cards. Uh, but it's a, it's a cool design. Yenit Cryptic Sovereign. Uh, another good stuff commander option in um, Esper Colors. Uh, you know, her, she, three power is not the biggest, but she, she would love to have an equipment slapped on her there. Uh, Flying Vigilance Menace would make her a good attacker and blocker. Vigilance there, she already has evasion built in. And just grinding out card advantage turn after turn, whether you're casting it for free or just drawing it. It's, it's good either way. She replaces herself, uh, you know, doesn't have haste, Esper, not the best at granting haste, unless you have Greaves or Boots. Um, would ideally like to get that replacement to happen the turn that she comes down. But she's like a mid-rangey threat, so she might not get dealt with. She will likely live to see combat, um, unless you're doing other scary things. Yuriko, the Tiger's Shadow. Commander Ninjutsu was talking about this earlier in the video. A way to cheat out a commander without paying command tax. 
the card, <laughs> I, I got thinking about how this works with Baleful Strix earlier, and it really got me salivating. Just imagine, casting a Baleful Strix, Baleful Strix replaces itself the turn it comes into play. No one's going to swing into a Baleful Strix. Then your next turn, you attack with the Strix. It doesn't get blocked because it has evasion and would kill any blocker, but then you ninjutsu this in, and then it deals combat damage. And you get to you know draw a card and opponents lose life. Then if you have some way to sacrifice your Rico for value, recast the Baleful Strix, draw another card off of that, and then next turn do it all over again. Ah, it's just so juicy. I like this card a lot. And blue, black, e even you know ignoring all of the card text here, I think blue and black are the two best colors in Commander. If I could only pick two, I would probably pick them. Maybe I'd pick blue, green. Maybe green is better than black. It's kind of apples and oranges, but I digress. Yuriko, very, very cool commander. Commander Ninjutsu is so, so, so cool. And there's so many ways that you can just get grindy turn after turn value here. Yeah, I like it a lot. Ancient Stone Idol is kind of a difficult card to assess. It just, it does a little bit of everything. It costs a lot of mana, but... You can reduce its cost if you have a kind of go-wide strategy. It doesn't pull you in a go-wide strategy in a vacuum. This is like a tall creature, right? You can either go tall or go wide. Uh, you generally want to choose one and go very linear in that direction. This, you know, kind of in a way pulls you in two directions. Although even if you don't have that many attacking creatures, the value you're getting off of this still might be worth, you know, 8 mana. So maybe you could have 2 creatures in play. Or if you're hard casting for 10, like Flash means that you can do it on an end step before your turn and then immediately be attacking with it. Or treat it as a pseudo-removal spell if an opponent is t attacking into you. You know, it has Trample, it has built-in Evasion, and the death trigger on it means that you can get it into some sort of, like, reanimator artifact strategy decks where you're sacrificing it and bringing it back with maybe Duretti Scrap Savant and then sacrificing it again and getting, you know, multiple 6-12s while... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It just does so many things. I have a hunch that Wizards has done, like, some focus groups where they try to figure out what the most fun moments in games of Commander are. And I have a hunch that cards that have lots of abilities kind of stapled onto them that could be applicable in like diverse ways and diverse situations lend themselves to um, you know game states where people are surprised in a good way about an interesting line of play that is available to them or maybe being used against them even uh, but in a very like sportsman like way you can appreciate you know a way that ancient stone idol is relevant that you might not have anticipated um, yeah I just think it's it's a cool card a lot to analyze with it can do a lot of things with it but um, yeah, I think I think I give it I give it an A. Ten mana is a lot, but I still think I give it an A. Coveted Jewel, also really good. Maybe I bump this up to a B plus. Uh, if all it said were the first two little chunks of text there, it would be amazing. Obviously, draw three cards when it enters. Tap for three of that mana right away. Um, the the ticket for building around Coveted Jewel is going to be some sort of an artifact reanimator strategy where you can sacrifice artifacts, then bring them back, and sacrifice them, and bring them back. If you can cast this for six, then float three mana, then sacrifice this, I don't know, to a Clark Clan Ironworks, then you've only lost one mana on the turn, uh, and then if you have a way to like bring it back with a Duretti or a Trash for Treasure or a Scrap Mastery and then draw three more cards and then add three more mana and then sack it one more time to the Krog Clan Ironworks. Like the, the key here is going to be having a sack outlet and making sure that this is not in play by the time you pass turn. But as long as you can do that, this card is really, really strong. Can definitely be a part of some like probably game ending turns, probably some game ending combos where you draw your deck and make infinite mana with it somehow. Um, Endless Atlas, giving this one a straight up A. It's going to see lots of play in one and two color decks in colors that have a hard time drawing, so mainly red and white. I would say, yeah, this should go in probably any Boros deck. <laughs> uh, maybe not each and every one, but um, yeah, any mono white deck, any mono red deck, any red white deck, and maybe some other colors too, if for some reason uh, you don't have better card draw options. I mean, yeah, I mean, t two mana to draw a card on a stick, you're going to get your value out of this. Um, if, if you can, if, if this stays in play for five or six turns, that's really incredible value. That, that has replaced itself many, many times over. I like this card 
a lot. Geode Golem, really cool to see that second you know, that, that block of text there, putting your commander into play directly without paying its mana cost. Uh, the fact that it's colorless means that you can put it in any deck. What it's missing, as so often is missing from a card, is haste. You would want a way to grant haste. This might be disproportionately good in decks with access to red, because red can grant haste so often, but trample's really good. Trample means you're almost always going to have an, oppo or an opponent without a, a big enough blocker to prevent this from getting through when it does swing. Um, it would also be very good in a deck with, you know, a high CMC commander. Off the top of my head, the Ur Dragon has access to red and also costs so much mana. Like, Progenitus would also be a good option. Um, yeah, I, th this is definitely going to find some homes. Doesn't go in any old deck. You know, if your commander has a low CMC, probably not worth dedicating a deck slot to this. But still, cool design space um, and will find some homes. Retrofitter Foundry. Uh, you know, it's a lot of text in any artifact that untaps itself for a, a certain amount of mana, you know, can go infinite, I'm sure, in some ways. I'm sure that there are some Rube Goldberg machine type ways to uh, go infinite or just get ridiculous value off of this. But that's a pretty specific subset of decks. Even in just a generic good stuff artifact deck, I don't know that I would recommend this. You know, it's a B minus. It'll find some homes. It only costs one mana. If you're like can tripping every time you cast an artifact, maybe might as well. But um, I just think there are better cards. Um, Forge of Heroes, you know, the opportunity cost here is you're not running potential color fixing. So in certain, you know, one color, two color, even three color decks um, that care about plus one, plus one counters or loyalty counters, like any deck with a Planeswalker commander probably would see fit to run this. Like an Atraxa deck that really needs that first plus one, plus one counter before proliferating every turn. But, you know, it's not, it's not amazing. Like, you might be better suited just running color fixing in a lot of decks, but that's why it's a common. You know, this feels good. It's a, it's a B-plus card. Glad to have that. And uh, finally here, Isolated Watchtower. Last new card of the set, uh, non-basic land that also pseudo-ramps. Uh, I, I think that's really strong. In a weird way, this fits pretty well into artifact strategies, I think. If the primary way that you plan to ramp in a game is through mana rocks, then that obviously does not affect your land count. Um, and so that means that the you know big block of text on this is more you know, relevant than otherwise. If you can successfully get a land into play, a basic land into play, multiple times off of this, then you have gotten crazy free value. Um, not to mention the scry one. If nothing else, you're just getting a scry one as like a mana sink. Like that is good on its own. So you know, given this card an A, we'll find many homes in, uh, yeah, probably in like one or two color decks, right? The fact that you need it to be a basic land is a little bit limiting, but you know, in mono color decks for sure. Uh, Monocolor decks that aren't green, because green probably you'll have the most lands in play and might not get to use the ability that much. But non-green monocolor decks, yes, Isolated Watchtower seems like an excellent include. And that wraps up the new card review. That is my opinion of every single new card in Commander 2018. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I will be back next Thursday with an episode of EDH Rec Tech as per usual. Just as I've been churning these out, as I've been like racking my brain about how to build out a uh, YouTube presence about Commander. Um, I've been realizing, watching other channels that you know, are doing it successfully, that they stay really current, and <laughs> my EDH Rec Tech is not current. There are no new cards in it because I designed all those decks last May. So they're evergreen content, but uh, I'll, I'll be interjecting here every once in a while trying to uh, talk about new cards that have come out slash are coming out. That's what I did right now. So hope you enjoyed it. If you did, subscribe for more content. Um, and until next time, call, call your mother. She misses you. She, she loves hearing your voice, all right? Just give her a quick call. All right. Good luck and have fun. <laughs>